day that the Lord has made, so let us all rejoice and be glad in it. My name is Monique Laurie. I'm Reverend Fox. And we are so happy you decided to join us here at the Park Church Online as your place to worship. Now, you already know how we roll. Go ahead and share this live stream because you do not want anybody to miss out on what God has for them. They can join via our YouTube, our Facebook, our app, our website. Is there anything else they can join? I think you covered it all. Yes, yes. <laughs> so we're so excited that you decided to worship with us. And today, we have a lot planned for you. Yes. It's second Sunday, so that means it's Youth Sunday. Woo woo! I see we got Judah in the house. We got the dancers behind me. So I am super, super excited. And also, today is Leading Lady Day. I am so, so happy. How has Dr. Kimberly Nash Alexander impacted your life? She's such a dynamic uh, woman of God, such a great leader and example on so many levels. I've had the opportunity to sit under her teaching uh, as it relates to taking care of yourself and spending quality time with yourself so that you can be sure you're ready to pour into others. But not only that, she's also led us in a way of making sure that our devotional lives are in alignment with what God has called us to be and called us to do. So super blessed to be up under her teaching, under her leadership, and under her example. How's Lady Kim impacted your life? Man, honestly, me and Carson used to dance together. So seeing Lady Kim play her role in the church and also have that strong motherly and nurturing spirit towards us and our teammates in the midst of all of her responsibilities was very impactful for me. So I am truly grateful for her. She would always share words of wisdom, how we can better ourselves as young ladies and future women. So I'm super blessed to have someone like her that I can look up to. To God be the glory. Our leading lady makes an impact wherever she goes. And if you're online right now, we want to go ahead and start showing our leading lady love by tagging her in your comments and letting her know how she's impacted her your life how we thank God for her and just pour into our leading lady to let her know that she is appreciated that we see her we recognize the impact that she's making and that we are praying for her so let's go ahead and light up the comment section regardless of what platform you're on so that we can be able to show love and shower her with love one of the things that stood out to me Monique when you we're talking it's just the example that she is just by doing what she does she's showing up being a mother to her child but at the same time she's impacting other young women along the way and for that we give God glory honor and praise and what a great way to do since this is women's history month as we celebrate dynamic women who are making an impact in the lives of so many around the world and continue to do great things all over. And we're here with a young woman, Monique Laurie, who's making an impact, who's a student at North Carolina A&T University, doing great things. And uh, we know, Monique, you've just gotten into a, um, an internship. Tell us how, that, how that's going. So the internship is amazing. It's called the Driving Force Internship, sponsored by Audi, hosted by the Black Automotive Media Group. And honestly, it's been very transformational and informative. We get to hear from executive representatives from the Volkswagen Group, um, from Audi, not Audi, but Audi. Audi, and our neighborhood yes. is, is Audi. Audi. <laughs> but it's Audi. Audi. <laughs> Yes, I've learned so much about the brand, but also the stuff that goes behind the scenes. Because I thought Audi was doing it big, but no, I realized that it's actually under the umbrella of Volkswagen. So it's also Bugatti, Porsche, um, and other big name brands. So wow, it's wow. It's very, very touching. That's amazing. What was one of the key things that got you going into or made the difference for you to be accepted into that program because you mentioned that that earlier what was that um honestly being well-rounded because I can write I know how to use Adobe Suite like InDesign Photoshop I know how to work Canva wow. which is also a design platform um, I have strong storytelling skills I have well audio not audio excuse me visually and written and just a multitude of things that started at TechFit 
Wow. So if you haven't signed your child wow, up for Tech Fit, wow, wow. sign your child up for Tech Fit right. because it can take you a long way. Awesome, awesome. One other thing before we go, because Monique, you're a dynamic woman of God. Uh, how has your faith played into you, your success? Understanding that faith is non-negotiable. Hold on. Honestly. She said non-negotiable, right? It's not an option, people. In fact, put your my faith is non-negotiable in the in the in the chat section. Non-negotiable. Non yes. Because you know, if I have a bad day at work or in class. I'm going to be fine, but if my spiritual life is not good, if my foundation isn't steady, I'm not good. Mm. So just nurturing that and caring for it like it's my first love, well, because it is my first love, wow. is important. Wow, so that's wow. one thing I have to stay wow. conscious of. Wow, to God be the glory. <laughs> Can we give God praise for this dynamic woman of God? We are so proud of you, Monique. We thank God for you. We join your family and being proud of what God is doing in and through your life. And we thank God that we get an opportunity to celebrate Women's History Month. We celebrate our leading lady. And we also celebrate something so important that's happening. It's, it's easy to take for granted that our young people that you're about to hear from are starting their faith journey within the context of our worship experience. Because they start their faith journey here along with their parents, they get an opportunity to get the power of God to go with them off to college, off to their workplace, off to the other places. So we should not come to these moments casually. We ought to be ready to open up our hearts and receive what the power of God is going to do through our young people. Because we know that if we start our young people, train them in the way that they should go, when they're old, they are not going to depart from it and that starts within the context of this worship experience. So my brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, Monique, but I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm looking forward to what God's about to do in our worship experience. So my brothers and sisters, go ahead and lean in. Get your hands ready to be lifted wherever you are to praise our God as we now go forward into worship with our young people leading us during this time. God bless you. Good morning, Park family. Will you rise to your feet to worship and praise with us on this morning? Hallelujah. How many of you are ready to give God worship and give God praise? Because at the end of the day, nothing else matters but worship and God. Hallelujah. The name of the song is Nothing Else Matters. Feel free to join with us and give God praise.
bless me. God, not just for me, but so everyone around me can have everything they need. Let all these folks that's with me, God, have everything they need. Let all these folks that's with me, God, have everything they need. request because it's not just for you but for everyone around you that they can have everything that they need is that somebody's request today Lord bless me so that I can bless somebody else amen let's give them a hand let's give them a hand they're singing about the power of God and how the power of God is able to supply the needs that I have and the needs that you have, and the needs that you have, and the needs that everybody around us has, we are grateful that God has that kind of power. That's the kind of God that we serve, amen? Amen, amen. And we serve the kind of God that's able to bless us even in times of grief and bereavement, and we know that those times come as well, right? And so we want to keep those among us who are grieving those among us who are bereaved right now, and there are some family members that we want to keep in prayer today. Tony and Joshua Banks in the loss of their cousin. Dr. Robbie Johnson in the loss of her niece. Tanya and Melvin Lowry and family in the loss of her cousin. And William and Bernadette Moreland in the loss of their daughter. We want to keep them in prayer. There may be some who whose name didn't make the list, but we want to pray for them as well. And this month, uh, we've been recognizing Women's History Month. And so we're going to pray today uh, a prayer of celebration for the amazing feats that have been uh, crossed and made by women. We're also going to pray for the journey ahead. And today we're celebrating our leading lady. You can go ahead and give it up for her now. We're going to pray a prayer for our leading lady and for her family. And we want to pray for you. So for those of you online, go ahead and put your prayer requests in the chat. Uh, for those of you in the building, you can just whisper that in the atmosphere or get it on your mind as we go to the Lord in prayer. Let us go to God in prayer. So God, today we want to say thank you. Thank you, God, for the blessings that you've blessed us with, not just for us, God, but for those around us. God, we're grateful. God, we thank you for the ability that you have to comfort and keep those who are 
grieving and those who are bereaved right now. And so, God, we pray right now for your peace, God, that surpasses all understanding. God, we pray even now, God, that you put people in their paths that will be able to speak a word that they need to hear in this season of their lives. And God, we thank you even now for the prayer requests that are in the chat section. God, for those who need healing, you're the great physician. And God, for those who need other things, God, you're the provider of all those things. And so God, we pray even now that you meet them at their points of need. God, we pray now, thank you for the women of the world. As this is Women's History Month, God, we thank you for all the cherished women in our lives, God. Uh, we thank you, God, for mothers and sisters and daughters and friends and neighbors, God. We pray right now for women across the globe, God, that they continue to be empowered, God, knowing the love that you offer to them. God, we thank you for women throughout the ages, God. Thank you, God, for the contributions and God, for the sacrifices, God, for the struggles, God, for all those uh, God, we thank you for who would not remain silent in places of inequity. God, we thank you. And today, God, we thank you right now for our leading lady. God, we thank you for her leadership. We thank you, God, for her compassion. We thank you, God, for her care that she has for this congregation. Thank you, God, for the gift that she is to the body of Christ. And God, we pray right now that you continue to bless her, continue to give her everything that she needs. Bless everything that concerns her and those who are connected to her. And God, now for the rest of our worship experience, God, we pray even now, God, that you continue to make your presence known and felt in this place. And God, we give your name glory, honor, and praise. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may go to your seats in the presence of our Lord. We want to say welcome to our worship experience today. For those of you who are in the building or for those of you who are online, thank you so much for joining us for worship today. If you're in the building and this is your first time worshiping with us, just, just wave at me. I just want to acknowledge you if this is your first time. God bless you. God bless you. Can we show them some park love? Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. If you're online, just type first time in the chat. If you type first time in the chat, someone is going to come and give you the greatest virtual hug that they can give you just to say thank you for joining us in worship today. And for those of you who are visiting with us, there's an easy way that we want to connect with you. And if you uh, text the word Easy Connect, so take out your devices, text the word Easy Connect to 704 237 6176. If you text Easy Connect to that number, you'll receive a visitor uh, connection card. Just fill that card out, send it back to us, and someone will be in touch with you just to, again to say thank you. Thank you so much for worshiping with us, for joining us in worship today. And now there are a few announcements I have that I want to share with you before we continue in our worship experience. Uh, this is for all of our young adult women. So if you're between the ages of 20 and 40, this is for you, all right? So as we continue to recognize and we continue to celebrate Women's History Month, there's an opportunity for all young adult women of the park uh, to get together, to have fun. Uh, this is a women's forum, a young adult women's forum, and it is this coming Saturday, which is March the 18th at 11 a.m. at Sunset Farms, Sunset, Sunset Farms, is located at 3432 Sunset Road. That is just a few minutes away from our Betty's Ford Road campus. And this is an opportunity for you to share your voice, but also to have some fun at the same time. So if you have further questions about that, please, you can send an email to kalexander at upbc.org. Again, that's kalexander at upbc.org. Now for all of the parents of our high schoolers. If you have a high schooler, just raise your hand. If you have a student who's in high school, all right? So this is for you. All right, so our high school is in Christ ministry. We'll have an information session. That's this coming Saturday at 10 a.m. and that's via Zoom as well. So we wanna make sure that you are equipped with everything that you need, you and your student, for success. Uh, 
learning how to prepare and to take the ACT and SAT, as well as receiving scholarship information in um, some, of, some of the important information, some of the important material that will be shared on that day. Also, if you have an eighth grader who will be going to high school, this is for you as well, so that you can go ahead and get a head start on what to expect from your eighth grader as they get ready to enter into high school. Again, that is March 18th, this coming Saturday at 10 a.m. If you would like to attend, please send an email to youth at upbc.org. That's youth at upbc.org, and you will get the Zoom information to attend. Again, that is youth at upbc.org. And also, keeping with our youth, our Sunday worship experience just has been a phenomenal experience as we've been gathering on first, third, and fifth Sundays. And we just want to let you know that starting next Sunday, we will be in a new space. Same vicinity, just a new space. So we won't be in the gym anymore. We are shifting to the choir room but we're still gonna have a phenomenal experience even in the choir room. So bring your youth down, bring your child down to meet with us in the choir room. Uh, God has been doing something special in our time in youth church. And just as our kids just sang a song that I felt was an unselfish song, bless me so that I can be a blessing to others. We recently had a prayer experience in youth church. And some of the prayer requests that our kids wrote were such unselfish prayers. They were praying for other people, not just for them. And so that's the kind of experiences that we have in youth church. So if your child is not involved in youth church, we want to see them next week. Next week, March 19th, we want to see you in the choir room. You'll, we'll have signage. We'll have people to let you know how to get there. Amen? All right. Now, you should have received a card when you came in, chosen card. Um, and if you receive that card, there is a QR code on that card. You can actually scan that card to get the information that you will need. You've been hearing about this chosen project for a couple weeks now, and you're gonna hear some more information about it on the Park News. And Chosen Sunday is next Sunday, but just in case you're not here, next Sunday, this is an opportunity for you to go ahead Get all the information that you need now so that you can be a part of this great work, so that you can be a part of what God is doing in the lives of these children in Tanzania. But you'll get to hear more information about that. If you're online, there's a QR code on your screen. You can go ahead and scan that code now and get the information that you need, again, so that we can be a part of what God is doing, not just in the Park Church, but globally in the lives of our children in Tanzania. Amen? All right, so now we're going to continue to hear more about what God is doing here at the Park Church as we prepare to hear the Park News. is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And we are certainly glad to be celebrating our leading lady today. Before we begin our celebration of Lady Kim, I do want to share some very important announcements with you this morning. First of all, didn't our young people do a great job of leading us into the presence of God this morning? We are so proud of their growth and maturity as they continue to seek and keep God first. We are also excited because our scholarship applications are now online at our website. And we want you to make sure that all of our Park graduates take the time to visit the site and download your scholarship application today. Your day of commencement is just around the corner and we want to make sure you have all the necessary tools to get off to a great start. 
The power to choose is in a child's hands. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world, Matthew 5 and 14. Shine and be generous with your life and prompt others to open up to a generous Heavenly Father. Park Church family and friends, we are just one week away from the amazing opportunity to step into a life-changing connection, one that empowers a child and their community, one that will provide help, hope, and healing. Whether you are an in-person or virtual worshiper, you have an opportunity to be generous with your life by becoming a child sponsor. For $39 per month, you will invest in the lives of vulnerable children in the Neololo and Kasamba communities that will help to address essential needs such as education, clean water, health care, and more, which are threats in the lives of vulnerable children. We want as many people who can to be in the building as possible so that you can have your picture taken at one of our photo booths that will be at our Beatty's Ford Road campus. But if you can't be there, there's still an opportunity for you to sponsor a child as well. Give a child the chance to choose you. Be chosen on March the 19th. Your love, prayers, and sponsorship will support the journey of transformation to achieve their God-given potential for the glory of God. Volunteers are needed to serve on our chosen launch and reveal weekends. To sign up to serve, please contact Demita Privet at dprivet64 at gmail.com. For more information about the chosen program, please contact Minister Kim Morrison at kmorrison at upbc.org. Okay, Park family, this is the time we set aside to honor the leading lady of the Park Church. I had an opportunity to sit down with Lady Kim this week, and what an amazing time we had. Take a look. Lady Kim, it is a pleasure to be with you today. I can't believe it has been a year. A year. A whole year. We were downtown a year ago jogging on seesaws, and a year has passed. Um, how has your year been? It's been a good year. I, I think it has gone by fast, kind of like in a blink. Mm -hmm. um, getting used to the empty nest and um, traveling with Bishop and um, just accomplishing a couple of things and, and then learning how to slow down. So it's I been see. a good year. I see. I can't wait to hear about that. Let's start by talking about the Living Faith Library. Oh, wow. I'm so excited about the Living Faith Library. The women's ministry has been using the Living Faith Library as part of the Monday Night Bible Study. Um, and we had two great teachers to go through and lead us through. And, and they asked me to do one of them. So I'm very excited. Starting on Monday, Cultivating the Garden of Your Soul will be the next Living Faith Library study. And the women's ministry will start it on Monday night, and then it'll be available to everybody after that. But it's been a great way to kind of walk through and take your time to grow in your own spiritual disciplines um, at your own pace. That sounds exciting, and everyone can benefit from that. Yes. I love that. I love that. I promised that the first question was not going to be about Cameron and Carson, but the second one will. So how has um, the life of an empty nester been, and um, what does motherhood look like for you now at their ages? Well, I have to say I am very surprised that motherhood has not gotten easier. Um, I really thought that when the kids got older that I would be at a different place in this motherhood. But it has been a faith journey. It has been a real faith journey. And I think um, how God has been stretching me to see, yes, you say you have faith, but when they're not right there, um, do you really have faith? And trusting God to be faithful to them just as he's been faithful to me. So it, it's been an adjustment for me and a real stretch in my faith. Mm -hmm. How are they in terms of uh, what they're doing now? Are they here for the summer or? Well, I have no idea where they'll be for the summer. At least Carson, I don't. Okay. I know Cameron will be um, in the Peace Corps 
she nice. she leaves in May and she'll be stationed in Ecuador for two years serving there and she did a great job and her job in Idaho and we got a chance to see her at work at the Sundance Film Festival and I had one of those mama moments that like wow She's really doing the thing. Yes, yes, that's <laughs> and it was exciting. Good. That's and exciting. Carson's in California and enjoying her sophomore year. So things are well. Good things, good things. Well, happy belated birthday. Thank you. 60 looks good on you, friend. 60 looks good on you. I cannot believe it. Wow, I tell you. So let me ask you this. How has your perspective on life and love um, changed since you've become 60? I think I realize that everything does not have to happen at the speed of light, mm. that I don't have to multitask. Mm. And I think um, my priorities are shifting. Um, just the seriousness of what, I'm gonna say the second half of my life is probably the last third, but what it will look like. Um, for me, it's very special because my father died at 59. Mm. So for me to, to reach 60, you know, I had this thing in my head like, oh, you know, I'm the same age dad was, will I make it beyond that? And uh, to see 60, it's been a joy. I mentioned that you're always doing something. You love action. Any new trips or any skydiving, parasailing, <laughs> snorkeling? All of that sounds wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. No, I've been riding dune buggies in the desert. That's oh, been my latest. Okay, okay. And it's been good. I've enjoyed that, and I am doing the triathlon in September. How do you and Bishop Alexander like spending your free time now? Any recent trips, any special destination or events that you guys have experienced together? It's been so exciting because now that the kids are not home, every time he has a trip, I have the option of tagging along, um, which has been fun, but he travels a lot, <laughs> so it's been a bit much, but I just enjoy hanging out with him um, and some of the things that we do of course the movies and of course anytime we can get to Disney that is it you know we are Disney bound you Every guys ride. are never gonna outgrow Disney are you no and one day hopefully we'll have grandkids and we can really just really do Disney all over again from another perspective I want to read something to you okay when I was preparing for this interview I, I came across this in my study it says that she is clothed in strength and dignity and laughs without fear of the future. And this reminded me of you. Um, in my daily meditation, I came across this before um, I knew that I would interview you. And I thought, oh my goodness, that is so Lady Kim, Aww. so Lady Kim. When you come out every Sunday, I just think you have a spirit of grace and excellence about you. Um, yet, if I may speak frankly, you're not stuffy. You're very approachable. <laughs> you're friendly. Um, you have the same struggles and issues that everyone else does. And you don't mind sharing and pouring into others. Um, you know, we love and appreciate Bishop Alexander, but we know behind every good man is a good woman. The one piece that I think is so important mm -hmm. is that people see me, but I think the authenticity of the fact that I, I struggle like everybody else. I have fears, I have you know, worries, I have concerns, I have my moments when mm -hmm. I don't quite get it right, mm -hmm. and I don't want um, people to have this um, this view of this person who is here. Because mm -hmm. I think in ministry what happens is we tend to um, attach ourselves to people and not to God. Mm -hmm. And so I want there to be some understanding of the fact that, you know, I fall often, literally. <laughs> Clumsy fall. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that there are moments when I, I wonder, um, should I just quit, mm -hmm. you know, or, or is, is it worth it? Right. You know, um, and then eventually my faith says, yes, it is. But those moments are very real. So how do you adjust your crown and move forward? What's your methodology? It just depends. Some days it's cry and then say, okay, get over yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are other days when um, I have some strong sister girls who come alongside me. Some of them are pastor's wives, um, some of them are close friends, and um, and I'll say, you know, hey, I just, and they will pray when I can't. 
On behalf of the, the church, all of the congregants, I just want to thank you for every sacrifice, mm -hmm. every one of our emergencies being a priority for you. Uh, thank you for every date night that was interrupted because someone needed something. Um, I thank you for who you are today and every day. And I love you. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I love you too. Mm -hmm. Perk family, help me celebrate the gift that we have in our leading lady, Dr. Kimberly Nash Alexander. Well, Park family, that's all I have for you today. Let's continue to extend the love, life, and lordship of Jesus Christ in all that we do. God bless you. All right, we can give it up again for our leading lady. Give it up, give it up for our leading lady. What, what a wonderful interview. Being able to gain some perspective from our leading lady about life and life's issues. It's, it's just another testament. To, it just shows us again how blessed we really are. You know, everyone in here had on masks, but I could see the smiles under everyone's mask. We were just so blessed by hearing your perspective and hearing from you. So let's give it up one more time for our leading lady. We'll, we'll, and we will now have a presentation to our leading lady um, by Deacon Richard Nichols of the Board of Directors. This is a great time, and I'm here with my leading lady, Sonia Nichols, to present to our leading lady, Dr. Kim Nash Alexander. Please come up. So think about this day that we celebrate our leading lady, or as I call her, the first lady of the Park Church. We're here today to represent all of you, the congregation, for what you do for us. Think about this. It's been 29 years, 29 years of support, 29 years of dedication, 29 years of putting up with us and the bishop. Think about that every day. Think about when you need her, what she says to you, no matter what's going on in her life. Think about how she greets you, how she handles things. And trust me, just like all of us, we have our pew persona, we have our car on the way to church persona. We have our waiting in the parking lot to leave a church persona. But she has to be Lady Kim all the time because one, that's who she is and that's what we expect. But she's told you that she falls. We're there to be there for her. But think about 29 years of dedication, 29 years of loving all of us. That's hard. Think about the grace she gives us when we call upon the bishop. Think about it. Think about the grace that she gives us when she needs to care for her, her family, right? So we're here today to say thank you, we love you. And those are nice words, but I don't know about you. I think there should be some action. So we want to give you a gift. Your flowers while you're alive, 
and a check for you to check out and share with whomever you want. No, no, no. <laughs> but we love you. And I'll close with this. I'm always about fun. F-U-N. F, first things first. We know you put Christ first. Then your husband. Then your family. Then us. It's in the right order. The you in fun is unity. You bring us all together. You say, let's come together. Let's do the right thing. And what I really love is the N is no limits. There's no limits on what we can do if we put things first, that we're unified, and no limits. So this is a small token for 29 years, and I wish you 29 more plus, and we love you. To God be the glory, great things he has done, for it's truly the Lord who has been my strength. I just want to thank you for the opportunity to serve as your first lady. God has blessed us, and I truly love each one of you. I'm just so grateful for the opportunity for, um, to be a part of your lives and to see how God is there in good times and bad. And to my children and to my husband, there is no greater joy than being your mom and your wife. To God be the glory. Thank you. Amen. Amen. We give God praise again for our leading lady. And as Deacon Nichols said, sometimes we have to put action behind the love that we say we have. And so we have an opportunity to do that now as it is time to give. And one of the ways that we will be giving is being a blessing to our leading lady. So if you have envelopes, if you're giving by way of envelope in the building, there's an other section. You can write it on the other section. But if you're giving virtually, you can also put that in the other section as a blessing to our leading lady. We want to be a blessing to her. And one of the things that our youth said earlier, this is still uh, ringing in my head, but the song, Bless Me so that I can be a blessing to other people. That is the reason why we give as well. We give so that we can be a blessing. God has blessed us so that we can bless others. And so we want to make sure that we are giving uh, out of obedience to what God has called us to give, but also because we want to be a blessing to others. And there are several ways that you can give today. You can give using the Givelify app. Just uh, Download that app. If you have it downloaded already, just select the Park Church. There are quick instructions you can follow there. You can text to give if you want to text to give, and that number is 704-271-9007. If you're on our website, there's a Give Online icon that's on your screen. You can give that way. If you want to use Bill Pay, you can use Bill Pay as an option as well. Make sure that you direct your donations to 6029 Betty's Ford Row. And if you're here in person, there's an envelope in the seat in front of you. You can use that envelope to give in the basket in front of you. Now, if you're on the risers, if you're on the risers, what you will do is take your offering and pass it down to the side by the wall. Pass it down to the side by the wall. The ushers will come through and they will pick up your offering from there. And again, we want to be a blessing to our leading lady. So on all of your platforms, you can use the other field to give and be a blessing to our leading lady. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, today we come to you thankful. Thankful, God, that you've blessed us. Thankful that we have an example in you that shows what giving looks like. Thankful for this moment that you've given us to give. God, we come to you with hearts of thanksgiving for your faithfulness. God, you've so richly and so abundantly given to us. And in this moment, God, we give back to you. And with what we give, God, we offer it as worship to you. And God, we pray that it is used uh, for your kingdom and for your glory. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Now let's take a moment to give to the Lord.
Father, we thank you for the blessing of this day, for the privilege that has been ours to know that it is you who woke us up, you who started us on our way, you who continues to sustain and maintain and provide. We thank you, God, that we're able to hang in there because there's somebody holding us. Thank you for holding us even when we let go, even when our grip grew faint and we couldn't hold on. You held on to us. Thank you. Thank you for being the one who sticks with us when the back is against the wall and when there is no way out. You make a way out. You've been the way out. You've been the way through. You've been the way over. You've been the way past. Father, we just say thank you. Thank you for bringing us to this current point. Thank you that we made it this far. And thank you, God, that you're working things out. You're handling things. You're providing things. You're healing us. And you're providing deliverance. For the chance that we have to be in your presence, for the opportunity that we've had to give you praise, and now, God, for us to worship you through the preaching and the hearing of your word, thank you. God, you know everybody who will be listening live and archived. You know exactly what you want to say to each person. You know what you want to do in each life. And so, Father, we, we just let you know our ears are open. Our hearts are open. Now attune our spirits to what the Spirit is saying to the church. <clears throat> God, I'm here. Show me where you're working. Let me join you there and give me grace to proclaim your word. Draw somebody to Jesus, advance your kingdom, and bring glory and honor to your own name. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. It is good to see everyone here. And for those of you who are worshiping with us virtually, we greet all of you in the name of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. Let me first of all thank you for the prayers that you prayed as we traveled to the United Arab Emirates and the city of Dubai for Movement Day Middle East. Uh, we needed those prayers. Your prayers were effectual because just when we were flying over the Atlantic and making our way towards Europe, we had to make an emergency diversion to Madrid because of a medical emergency. And I just thought to myself, it could have been any one of us who would have needed for the plane to land. The plane landed, the person got off safe, and we made our way. And, as you all know, I'm having these, these eye issues, and so being on a flight that long, that high, could have impacted my, my eyes severely. And while there was some pain, thank God for medicine. And the Lord made the medicine effectual. Over, one, over 1,200 people from the Middle East, Asia, and Africa came together in the city of Dubai for the worship of Jesus Christ, for the lifting up of his name, for the sharing of a collective vision, and for encouragement. And it was nothing short of amazing to see how people of different backgrounds, hues, languages, all were worshiping the Lord and how the Lord is active in places that none of us would even imagine possible. Our God is moving and we have the opportunity to be a part of that great work of God. 
But we're going to have another chance on next Sunday when World Vision is here and the opportunity for us to engage the nation of Tanzania and the young people who are there. And so I'm really excited about, about that as well. Bringing it closer to home, for the past three years, I've been working with a group of people uh, seeking to increase access to capital for black businesses, as well as churches seeking to do community economic development. One of the aspects in the racial reckoning to which we must come is that there has been a historical gap, lack of access to capital. It's not a matter of, not a matter of how well a business does. A business can be cash flowing well, but if you do not have the social connections that are behind the scenes to help make the deals flow, oftentimes you don't get the benefit of the doubt. And so we've been working with Crow Global, that is the eighth largest accounting firm in the world, to help address this issue. And so we're going to be dealing with 50 cities. Charlotte is one of the first eight. And beginning on tomorrow, we're going to be working with uh, funders. We're going to be working with clergy. On, on Tuesday at 8 o'clock, we're going to be dealing with black business owners. And so if you are a black business owner and, and you want to have information, you want to develop relationships with those who can help you get things together so that you have increased access to capital to survive and scale your business, go on Crow Beacon. We don't have anything to, to uh, show them. No, okay. Go to crowbeacon.com and you'll be able to get, get, that, get that information. Now, it will be 30 years as leading lady in November. Some of you all heard 29, and, and, you, and you're trying to put the math together. Well, Lady Kim and I have been together dating and married. It will be 31 years. In November, it will be actually 30 years as husband and wife and her officially being the leading lady of, of the church. Because I came here single. I was a lonely man. <laughs> I, came here, I came here single at, at, at 26. The first question that was asked of me before I even had my first interview was, when would I get married? And I, and I said to Mary Streeter over the phone, when the Lord sends me a wife. And with that being the answer, the church, with its faith in God, they still called me as a single man at 26. Now, having called me at 26, they hoped that I would get married rather quickly. And some of them may have even had ideas as to who I should marry. But it would take uh, two two years of being here, that I, would, that I would be on my second blind date. Uh, the same individual introduced us. The first blind date, well, suffice it to say, didn't go so well. And, uh, and the second one was at Harper's on Fairview, October 15th, 1990. Two. And um, she ate off my plate on the first blind date. And uh, she was cute, had a nice little gray and black dress. She didn't want to sit in front of me, so she sat beside me, so all I could see was her profile. But, but, but that was enough to create intrigue. And I, I asked her a question because uh, I wanted to see, you know, 
you, you know, you, you ever been with somebody, they look good until they open their mouths. So I wanted to see what that was about. And so I asked her, I asked her a question, uh, how does she define a good black man? And she gave me a five-minute answer. I wasn't expecting a dissertation, but she had it. She had it. She had it. She had it. And ours was a, um, ours was a, was a relatively condensed courtship. Caught everybody off guard. We, we met October 15th. We were engaged December 31st. Caught both families off guard. And the church, because she was unknown to everybody. Because she wasn't Baptist. Uh, she was AME Zion. She had lived in D.C. Uh, for some years and had just recently moved back. So, so the, the church didn't know her. And, and because they didn't know her, and all, all of a sudden, I'm introducing her not as girlfriend, but as fiance. I, I didn't even give them a chance to give voice to the matter. <laughs> And so we got married November 27th, 1993. And uh, it's been quite a blessed journey. You should know that she is the, in, the, in what will be the 110-year history of our church, she is the longest-serving leading lady in the history of the church. And she has given of herself in so many different ways. Uh, she has been able to withstand and endure uh, scrutiny. She has been able to endure misperception. She has been able to take uh, slights with grace and the average tenure of a pastor is five years or less and in studies of, of clergy 70% of spouses wish their their pastoral spouse would find another job Want that to sink in. And part of the reason why she is the longest serving lady lady in the history of the church is because I am the longest serving pastor in the history of the church. And the reason why that is significant is I have not had to choose between the health of my marriage and staying with this church. And that is also a credit to you as a congregation. You have made it so that has never been an issue. You've made it so that there's been not a conversation in our home, when we gonna leave? Can we find something better? I don't like the way that they're treating you. That has not been a conversation because of the type of church that you have been. And I want to say thank you to you for the way in which you have treated us and my wife. Thank, thank you. Thank you for giving me the liberty to be the pastor of the church. Thank you for the support. Thank you for the reinforcement. Thank you for the love. Thank you for the excitement. Thank you for it. Oh, you look good. You're still fine. Got me working out trying to keep up. My daughter Carson, she's getting embarrassed because we talk about these things. But if it wasn't for us talking and doing these things, she wouldn't be here. So there it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, having said that, uh, let's go to the word of God. <laughs> Folks saying amen, okay. Well, if 
if the pastor and the, and the, and the wife don't have a healthy marriage in all ways, then that, that's a bad example to you. Yeah. So, so you, you, don't get uncomfortable when we start talking about these things. Be glad that we can talk about these things. Amen. A amen. Yeah, yeah, we all right. <laughs> amen. Mark chapter 3, beginning with verse 31. And then it will be John chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. The word of the Lord is as follows. Then his brothers and his mother came, and standing outside, they sent to him, calling him, and a multitude was sitting around him. They said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brothers? He looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. Then after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Thus far, the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Will you roll? There was a family. They played together and laughed together. But they weren't completely alike. And as they grew older, their opinions widened and they distanced from each other. Conversations became heated. Reunions became more and more uncomfortable. They thought they were made for each other. One thinking of one another. Brother aligned against sister. Never thinking just for one second. Birthdays were ignored. Gatherings stopped. Because each had to be right. We don't want them, oh no. We don't want them, we don't want them, we don't want them. Then his brothers and his mother came, and standing outside, they sent to him, calling him. A multitude was sitting around him. He said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. For even his brothers did not believe in him. I want you just to look at somebody and just say family. 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 My beloved sister in the spirit, Dr. Joan Parrott, would often say, ain't no drama like family drama, because family drama don't stop. Families are the basic unit of human society. They are the fundamental building blocks that God established on earth for the furtherance of his cause. Families matter. Families are important. Now, there was no prenatal cue that allowed us to pick the families into which we were, were born. It's not like you were a zygote and you were able to pick who would your mother and your father be. We did not choose our birth families. Whether we know them or not, Elizabeth Berg rightly notes, you are born into your family, and your family 
is born into you. You are born into your family, and your family is born into you. That which has survived the very beginning of the family's existence across time is born into you and me. It's transmitted through DNA. It's, it's born anew through the combination of two parents' DNA. And it is further formed and informed by the families with whom we grew up, whether they were those of our births, those of adoption or fostering, or those of blending by blended families. So much of who we are is caught by the context of our families. And we aren't aware of all that we're catching at the time of it being caught and internalized. It is so profound that another friend, Pete Scazzaro, has said, Jesus may be in your heart, but Grandpa is in your bones. Have you ever, those of you who are adults, have you ever found yourself just doing or saying some things and it caught you because that was what your parents said? That was what your parents did? And even though they didn't teach you to do it, you caught it just by being in their environment. In our growing up, we grow up either into the families of our birth or families into which we've been brought. And in both cases, we enter into relations that we didn't choose. We receive parents that we didn't choose, siblings that we didn't choose, and who for the most part, the siblings didn't choose us. In the case of siblings, if we are of common parentage, we share DNA, but there are some differences. And if we are of uncommon parentage, the DNA differences may be profound. Whether of common parentage or not, personalities differ. Temperaments differ. Perspectives and perceptions differ. And those differences are from the very beginning. One child enters the world with hands open. The other child enters the world fist clenched. Into the world differently. And while families are created by God to be the fundamental building blocks of a society and the means through which he seeks to achieve his purposes in the world, families are challenging. Tell your neighbor, they are challenging. They are challenging for every person in the family. No family and no member of the family has been or will be without some challenge or issue with somebody else in the family. Sometimes it can be with an individual in the family. And then other times it can be with the whole family as a whole unit. And, 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 and in most families, I believe that everybody within the family has wished that they could run away from home at one time or another. Did you ever wish you could run away? Did you ever plan your runaway? Did you ever actually run away? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, all, all of us at one point or another, wish we could run away if just for a minute. How do I know? Because shopping malls are many runaways. Bars, many runaways. Work, many runaway. After school can be a many runaway. Now here's how you know your child really wants to run away. When they start looking up the after school for after school, Three-year-old three -year third grader says, I think I want to take a trigonometry class. That's a mini run away. And all of us had these mini runaways, and some of us even spiritualized mini runaways. I'm going on a personal retreat. It's going to be just me and Jesus. And, and, that, and, that, and that was cool until COVID came. COVID shut down every mini runaway. Even the retreat center said, be at home with Jesus. 
None of us could run away, and we had to just be with our families. Because families are challenging, even the best of them. Why? We didn't choose them, and we can't escape them. And if by some chance a child gets a writ of emancipation from the family or is rescued from the abuse that is within the family of birth, adoption, or blending, whatever familial entity he or she will enter still will have challenges. Because, friends, there are no perfect families because families are made up of imperfect people. And hence, every family has its rubs because every person has edges. Every person has edges. And in a family unit, whether it's just a husband or wife or a husband wife with children or, or a single mom with children, everybody in those families has edges, which means there are rubs. And what is true of biological, blended, and adoptive families is also true of spiritual families and congregations. There are no perfect churches. None. Every one of them is fraught with challenge, rubs, and edges. And the more invested that you are in them, the more likely you are to see them because it is at that point that the church ceases to be the spiritual shopping center or concert hall and actually becomes family. You know, the, the customer at Starbucks has a different experience than the worker at Starbucks. As a customer, you get the smile, you get the polite call of your name, you get what you are ordered, and you are gone. But the workers at Starbucks, they get the personality differences of each other. They get the miscommunications. They get the coworker coming in late and wanting to leave early. They are a work family. Family is a gift, and family can be a challenge. And every family has its share, even the family of Jesus. Have you ever thought what it must have been like to be a part of Jesus' family? You know, we love Jesus. We, you know, Jesus is our Savior, best thing that ever happened to us. But could you imagine growing up with Jesus? being Jesus' younger brother or younger sister. Because his family starts with major drama. Mary gets pregnant before she and Joseph are married. And the birth father wasn't Joseph. It was the Holy Spirit. But who believed that? The only ones who knew for sure were Mary and Joseph. And at first, Joseph had his doubts. It took a visit from the angel of the Lord to settle Joseph down and get him on board. But for everybody else, the birth of Jesus was filled with stigma and innuendo. Neither Joseph nor Mary's immediate family were close to them. Mary had to journey to Elizabeth, a cousin, to get some support and some encouragement. And when Jesus is born, there are no grandparents' parent pr present. It's the cows and the sheep who welcome Jesus into the world. It's shepherds and magi who come to visit and not his family. And then Jesus has brothers and sisters who were born into the family. They didn't choose to be his brothers and sisters, and he didn't choose them. And they grew up having to hear the talk about Jesus and his parents. Yeah, there go, there go Jude, he's Jesus' brother. You know, now you know he belonged to Joseph and Mary, but that Jesus? Still out there. And I would imagine that Jesus was a little different. <laughs> I mean, his interests were different. They were into their version of whatever marbles and hopscotch and, you know, basketball was. And Jesus was out there observing the lilies of the field looking at the sparrows of the sky. Jesus was the one who went missing from the family, and Joseph and Mary had to search for him, and they don't find him on the basketball court. They find him in the temple, talking about 
being about his father's business. I wonder how Joseph took that moment, knowing that Jesus wasn't talking about the carpentry business, talking about who the real daddy was. And the whole trip back home was held up because of Jesus. The older that Jesus became, the more particular and peculiar he was. The more set apart he became, the more difficult it was to understand him and to be understood by him. After all, how do you get knowing the word made flesh dwelling among us, having power that he doesn't even use? And then at age 30, Jesus emerges. He's baptized by his cousin John, who declares him to be the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. And he solicits his first recruits, who are going to be his disciples, who are going to be those to whom he would leave the keys and, the, and entrust the furthering of the kingdom work. And none of them are his family. They're strangers to him. He leaves Nazareth, goes to other cities such as Capernaum, healing many who were sick, casting out demons. Capernaum becomes, becomes his home base, not Nazareth. He pushes the envelope in chapter 2, declaring himself to have the power to forgive sins as well as to heal and calling Levi the publican to join his crew and hanging out with publicans and sinners. And this gets back home to Nazareth. He's pushing the edges. Chapter 3 continues by his healing a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. That gets back to family where, where it's one thing to have to deal with the stuff around Jesus' birth. But this takes it to another level. And it hits on two levels. The first is the added scrutiny that comes with Jesus pushing the envelope of what's acceptable and proper. And on the other level, it's Jesus healing people, but he let Joseph die. Think about that. You healing other people, and our daddy got sick, you let him die. Why'd you let him die? If he was your daddy, would you have let him die? You gotta, you gotta realize these are human beings, flesh and blood, just like you and me. And all of the things to which we, were, we are prone to think, they too were prone to think. And so verse 20 comes around with Jesus returning home and he's met by a crowd. And when the family heard it, Mark says they went out to seize him because people were saying that Jesus is beside himself. The family wanted to do an intervention. The scribes were saying he was in league with Satan Filled with an evil spirit. And that brings us to the particular text and verses that I read. Mary and the brothers come and stand outside the house. Picture all of us in, inside the church and Mary and the brothers are out in the parking lot. And they, and they pass a note to the usher to take to Jesus to tell him that they are outside, with the inference being, leave what you're doing and come outside to us. Jesus responds, who are my mother and my brothers? Jesus has family drama. And I want you to know Jesus gets family drama because Jesus had family drama. And, and, and the text shows us his family drama didn't even stay in the house. Is outside the house. Can you imagine being in that setting with Jesus' people outside and Jesus staying on the inside? And, and, and maybe the person didn't whisper, Jesus, your family outside. Now, yet when them loud ushers, hey, Jesus, your family outside. Can you imagine being in the sanctuary? And rather than, rather than us celebrating Lady, 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 Lady Kim being with us, Lady Kim and Carson outside, hey, pastor, your family outside. What would that be like? That's family drama. <laughs> I find it interesting 
how Jesus deals with the drama in his family. Because he shows us how to handle family and the drama that comes with it. The first thing that Jesus teaches us is to separate intimacy from intention. Intimacy from intention. Jesus is met with the message that his mother and brothers are outside seeking for him. Now, the first part of the message speaks to the intimacy of the relationships. They are his mother and brothers. These are the people believed to be the closest to him. His mother carried him, brought him into the world, nurtured him, protected him, sacrificed for him. His brothers grew up with him, shared beds, shared rooms, shared meals with him. These are the people who've known him the longest. This is his kinfolk. This is his blood, your, your mother and your brothers. That's the intimacy. But the second part speaks to intention. They are outside seeking you. Now, there seems to be a paradox here. Because if they were seeking him, one would think they'd come inside where he is. But they're not seeking entrance into where he is. They're not seeking to be included in the midst of what he's doing. They're not looking to experience the power of what he's releasing inside. They stay outside because their intention is outside, not inside. Jesus distinguishes the difference between intimacy and intention. As intimate as their relationship may suggest, there's not alignment of intentions. Family had a different agenda. And Jesus was not blinded by the intimacy. He recognized the difference in intention. And he refused to allow the intimacy to move him into getting caught up in a maligned intention of distraction and subterfuge. My friends, this is a crucial point because the enemy will often use the intimacy of relations to blind us to maligned intentions and off-base agendas. That is to say, those closest to us have the greatest access to us and have the power to pull us away by our desire for them. You do know it was Adam's desire for Eve that blinded him to the maligned intent, not of Eve, but of the serpent. When it comes to the avoidance of distraction and subterfuge, you must be able to discern between intimacy and intention. Samson, that was his failure. He could not discern intimacy from intention because everybody who lets you lay their heads on their lap does not mean you well. He could not distinguish between intimacy and intention. That's what Job had to do when his wife came up to him and said, Job, why don't you curse God and die? Job had to separate intimacy from intention, and that's what allowed him to say, you're talking like a foolish woman. We take the good days from God. Shall we not also take the bad from God? Jesus separates the intimacy from the intention. And therefore, he stays inside while they are outside. And then he says, who is my mother? Who is my brothers? And he looks around at those sitting, and he says, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. Here Jesus shows us that when we're dealing with family and the drama that comes with them, sometimes we've got to locate ourselves in a broader context of relationships. And here is the tension between family and family. There's the family of his birth who are on the outside, and there's the family of his belonging that's on the inside. And, we, and we, it would be wonderful 
if both the family of birth is also the family of belonging. But sometimes they are not the same. The family of his belonging is tied to purpose and the assignment of God on his life. The family of belonging are those tuned in to the business of the father that he announced when he was in the temple as a boy. And while the family of his birth is on the outside with intentions contrary to the father's call on his life, there are those on the inside sitting around him seeking to connect with what the father had in mind. They would be his brothers. They would be his sisters. They would be his mother. Ideally, the family of birth should be the family of belonging. And at first they are. But then the Lord's purposes can become clearer and may involve what brings tension and forces adjustments. And the question is, how will they adjust? Will they join God in what God is doing? Will they continue to be a place where you and the purposes of God belong? And it's wonderful when they are. But when they are not, there is a larger context. And the larger context is those who are tied to God and tied to God's purposes. It is the larger family of God with brothers and sisters. By, by faith in Jesus Christ, we are baptized into one body being the body of Christ. And we are adopted into the family of God. We are given the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We become heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And it is then that we discover a larger context of family. There's a family of birth. And blood, and then there's the family of our rebirth, and the family of the blood. And that is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is global in its dimensions and sweep. It is diverse in its makeup. It is multi-hued in its composition. And there are few places on the globe now that you can go where there is not a brother or sister in the faith. You heard about Cameron going to Ecuador for two years, and i got to be honest, I, I really haven't always been feeling that. But I'm coming to realize she put God on it. I can't argue with that. i got to be the family of belonging. And part of being the family of belonging, I've got to put my faith in the fact that not only will God have her, but that there are some folk in Ecuador who know God for himself and who will be the family of faith on her behalf. There is a larger context. It's the family of God. When forcibly separated from their kin during slavery, the invisible institution of the church became family for African slaves and their descendants. When the onslaught of Jim Crow prompted the great migration from the south going northward and westward that separated families, it was the church that became family for college students and people new to a city because of a job. The church has been family. It's been in the church that they discovered brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers. It's been the church where people of common faith and belief, aspiration and hope and witness are found together, having been brought together and bound together by the work of the Holy Spirit. I thank God for the church being the context of a larger family because in my 41 years of my life, they've been spent in places away from my family of origin. And everywhere life has taken me, there was a family called the church where I found brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers in Atlanta. It was at Grace Covenant Baptist Church. I found mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers. As a seminary student in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I found it at Mount Olive Baptist Church and Second Baptist Church. And then I found it at Morning Star Baptist Church where I met Nicole Martin's grandmama. That's how I got to know Nicole as a middle school student. And then in 1990, I was called as a single man to Charlotte with absolutely nobody here but the church. I found some mothers. I found some fathers. I found some brothers. I found some sisters. I thank God for the larger family of faith called the church. And I wonder, am I by myself? 
I wonder if there are any people who are thankful for the larger family because in the larger family you found mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers in the larger family you've had some prayer support and you've had some emotional support and you got some financial support and you've had some educational support you've got some vocational support it's been the larger family with his birth family standing outside with maligned interests, Jesus asserts the context of a larger family. It's the family of God. Sitting on the inside are brothers and sisters and mothers. His birth mama, brothers outside. Jesus stays seated on the inside with those around him. And we aren't told how long they remained outside, you know, because Jesus could be long-winded in his sermons. But the chapter ends with them on the outside and Jesus on the inside. And then chapter 4 opens up and Jesus tells parables of the kingdom. And the first parable that Jesus teaches is that of the sower and the soils. It's the first one because Jesus knows that at the end of the last chapter, what was fresh on their minds, how can those closest to Jesus be in his family and those supposedly closest to the faith being religious leaders, how can they not get Jesus? Well, those who are the furthest away from Jesus and the furthest away from the religious tradition, how can they get Jesus? In other words, if Jesus is all that they believe him to be, why isn't everybody on board? And so Jesus tells the parable of the sower who sows and different soils and it has different results because Jesus wants them to know the issue isn't with the sower and it's not with the seed. The issue is the condition of the soils. And even though the sower starts sowing out and it falls on rocky ground, so some more falls on race, wayside ground. So some more falls on thorny ground. The sower keeps on sowing, and there's some good ground. And in the good ground comes 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. In other words, uh, in spite of what isn't happening, where you'd expect it to happen, the sower keeps on sowing until it falls on some good ground. And what that is demonstrating is that when it comes to family and the drama that comes with them and the rubs that come with them, you never give up hoping for a change. While Jesus' mama and brothers stood outside that day, embarrassed by Jesus, seeking to do an intervention because they think he's crazy, Jesus keeps on pursuing the will of God. Keeps on teaching, keeps on preaching, keeps on healing, keeps on pushing the edges of conventional wisdom, doing stuff that might embarrass them, keeps on pushing the buttons of the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes, keeps on announcing and demonstrating the coming of the kingdom of God. And as he did, he kept hoping for a change. He had to say, I'm entrusting them to God the Father, and I'm going to keep on doing what the Father has in mind for my life and the first to come around was his mama it was Mary we aren't told when it happened we just know that there came a time when it happened and the way that we know it is by the time that we get to John chapter 2 there's a wedding feast at Cana of Galilee where Mary and Jesus are present and it's the reception and the wine has run out Mary goes to Jesus with the issue and Jesus says what that got to do with me my hour has not yet come. And just like every other mother, she just ignores what Jesus says, goes to the servants and says, whatever he says, do, do it. A change has come over Mary. She's no longer embarrassed by him, no longer trying to seize him and stop him from doing. But now she is uh, by encouraging others to fall in line. Whatever he says, do, do it. A change came over Mary and Jesus just kept on being Jesus, pursuing the path of God, doing the work of his father, hoping for a change. And then you get to John chapter 7 and the brothers still aren't on board. They, they still do not 
believe in him after all that Jesus has done between Mark chapter 3 and John chapter 7. They still do not believe. But guess what? Jesus just keeps on being Jesus. Keeps on pursuing the path of God. Keeps on doing the will of the, God, uh, of the Father. Keeps on hoping for a change. And he realizes, I've got a larger family. Mary is now a part of my larger family. I got people who are caught up with the kingdom. There's Nicodemus the Pharisee. There's Joanna and Chusa and Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Salome. And there's Joseph of Arimathea. There's Jairus and there are others. He's got a larger family and his path now is going to take him to the hour for which he came into the world. There at the hill called Calvary. There at the cross, there's Mary right there, his mama and John the disciple. And it is there that Jesus says, I'm going to seize the larger context of family for them both. I'm going to say, Mary, woman, behold thy son. And I'm going to say to John, son, behold their mother. In other words, I don't see Jude here. I don't see James. But mama, I want you to know I got you covered because I'm going to give you John. And John's going to be your son. And John's I'm going to give you my mother Mary and she's going to be your mother and it was for the hope that all might come to him into the family of God that he hangs there bleeding and dying it was so that those of us who are far off might be brought near by the power of his blood he died hoping for a change and then God raised him from the dead on the third day morning and we are told that it was after Jesus died after Jesus was resurrected that a brother by the name of James he came around it was James who would then become the head of the church at Jerusalem it was James who would write the epistle that bears his name it was James who gives us the words count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations no Knowing that the trying of your faith works patience but let patience have its perfect work that you might be pure and my God thorough and complete lacking nothing it's James who tells us submit yourselves therefore to God resist the devil and he will flee from you it is James who tells us we count them happy that endure it was after Jesus died and was resurrected that James came around that James caught it that James James carried it but then there's another brother who came around and he called it his name is Jude and we get one chapter book in the book of Jude and it's Jude who tells us my God he tells us now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to, rid and to prevent your faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forevermore I want somebody to know Jesus gets family Jesus gets the drama that comes with family but guess what Jesus never gives up Jesus never stops hoping for a change Jesus says some change might come while you live and there will be some other change that will come after you die he came after I died after I was resurrected after I ascended and well might we all thank God that he never gave up hope he never gave up hope on us but he kept on praying to the father on our behalf don't you know that that's what he does sitting at the right hand of the throne of God making intercession on our behalf that's why John says in his first letter my little children these things write I unto you that you sin not but if anyone does sin we have an advocate with the father being Jesus Christ the righteous and he is the propitiation for our sins Where well, might we thank God that God that there was a family who never gave up hope who never gave up on our behalf they never stopped praying they never stopped believing they never stopped interceding they never stopped prompting they never stopped trusting some may have died before we came around but their prayers were heard by God the day that God prayed them and the God who heard them at the time that they prayed them had his own answer and while mama might not have seen it on this side it came with a being on the other side because the God to whom they prayed never gave up 
I wonder, am I talking to anybody who can say, I thank God that I serve a God that does not give up on me. I thank God that I had family that did not give up on me. I thank God that God was patient enough to wait on me until my change comes. And that's why it causes me to say, I agree with the songwriter, his love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on us. On and 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 on it goes. It overwhelms and sacrifices and satisfies my soul. I'll never be afraid because this one thing remains. The love of God never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out. And I wonder is there anybody who can say I pushed the envelope. I tested to see how far the love of God went. And I found that everywhere I went the love of God was right there. That's why when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, Hallelujah, I thank God that he did not give up on me. He did not. He does not give up on us. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Somebody knows I'm here because he didn't give up. I'm here because he didn't let go. I'm here because it didn't run out. I'm here because he kept on. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here because he did not give up. Mama cried, daddy cried, big mama cried. He didn't give up on me. Yeah. Never runs out on me. I'm here. love has not run out his love has never failed his love has never given up there's nothing that you've done there's no place that you've been that has caused him not to love you or to even love you any less than he always has 
and he wants to love you into the family of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but has everlasting life. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us first, sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. If you are under the sound of my voice, whether in person or virtual, the Lord is speaking to you. He's saying, I want you to be a part of my family. I want to be your father, and I want you to know what it is for me, for you to be my child. For you to have the life that I can give. And that comes through accepting his son Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. I want to lead you to Jesus in the privacy of your own heart. I just have you pray this prayer. God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I thank you for loving me. I thank you for letting me be alive. I thank you for speaking to me. I hear you. And I'm saying yes to you. I don't know everything, but I know you're talking to me right now. And I'm saying yes to you. I, I, I admit, yes, I have sinned. Not just bad stuff that I did, but good stuff that I should have done that I did not do. You call that sin too. I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying I'm sorry for it. I realize I can't change it, but you sent Jesus to save me, to forgive me, to redeem me, to bring me back to you. So God, I'm accepting Jesus right now. With my mouth, I confess that Jesus is Lord, and within my heart, I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead. So God, will you take me? Will you fill me with your spirit? Will you make me into the person that you know I can be? By faith, I declare I'm saved. I have eternal life because I believed on the name of your son, Jesus, who is the Christ. It's in his name and for his sake that I pray. Amen. Heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed. If you prayed that prayer, salvation is yours. It's not a matter of your feeling. It's a matter of your faith. If you did pray that prayer while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I, I want to thank God for what he's done for you. And so if you're in the room and you prayed that prayer, I just want you to raise your hand. If you're worshiping with us virtually and you prayed that prayer, you accepted Jesus, I want you to put in the chat feature, I accepted Jesus. There's some information we want to give you about this new life that you have in Jesus. And so will you give us your email address and your name? There are people who've been praying for you or waiting for you to make this decision. And they want to send you some information about this new life and the next steps of your life in God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for a brother, a sister, having been loved into your family, having accepted Jesus by faith. And now, Father, we ask that you might pull them close, hold them tightly, let them hear your voice, feel your love, and walk in your way for who they are and for who they will be by the working of your hand upon their lives. We thank you right now. We pray this, God, in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Minister Gallows. Amen. Amen. Can we give God praise? Can we give God praise? praise for those who are saying yes for those who are saying yes amen praise God and God may be speaking to you now he may be speaking to you now and this moment has been created for you this moment has been created for you to respond to the voice of God and Bishop has already extended the invitation for salvation but you still have this opportunity to say yes to Jesus also those of you God may be speaking to in this moment to say I want to connect with the body of believers by way of membership with the Park Church and if that is you then you can text the word membership to 704-237-6176 if you're in the building or if you're online but if you're in the building our assimilation team is right here to my right and they are ready to serve you we can get you started with our new members orientation we can help you find your place where God will have you to be where God will have you to serve but if God is speaking to you in this moment 
then this is your opportunity to respond to the voice of God. Amen? Amen. And can we give God praise for the word of God today? Give God praise for the word of God today. And I just want you all to be on the lookout, to be on the lookout for uh, some follow-up to today's sermon. Amen. Give God praise. Let's give God praise. He's still speaking and he's still moving and people are still responding. And so we give God praise for that. And you still have an opportunity to respond. Amen. But we want you to be on the lookout today on all of our virtual platforms or via email within the day and the next day. We're going to have some follow-up. We're going to have some follow-up to the Word today because this is another way to keep you engaged and to get you engaged with what God is saying and reflect on how God may be speaking to your heart. And so be on the lookout on all of our social media channels. Be on the lookout in your emails because you're going to get that follow-up, some questions that you can follow up and reflect on how God may be speaking to you through the Word of God. Amen. And don't forget, we're going to be uh, let out by our ushers. We're going to be escorted out by our ushers. So follow their direction as we go out. But we're now going to go back to Bishop Alexander as he gives us his final words and the benediction. some families there are some things that where the edges are rubbing some parents are worried about children or children worried about parents siblings worried about each other but what Jesus shows us is the power of a hope and a love that does not give up and the same is true for you same is true for them and if the Lord could reach you <laughs> he can sure enough reach them if the Lord could deal with you he can certainly deal with them father right now I'm bringing to you parents worried about children children worried about parents Siblings worried about each other. Grandparents worried about grandchildren. Spouses worried about the other spouse. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, you are the one who loves them most. You are the one who loves them best. You are the one who can speak in ways in which they can hear in languages that only they'll be able to understand. Father, we know you're able because you did it with us. And because you are not a respecter of persons, if you are able to deal with it, us, you're able to do it for them. And so Father, we're releasing them and we're trusting you with them and we're trusting you with it. Knowing you to be the God who's able not just to keep from falling, but you are the God who's able to bring those who are far off and bring them near. So we're trusting you and believing you just for that. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus, 
the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.